bonjour. Alors je pense. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. And thank you for coming to this uh, beautiful, cool, balmy tent. I'll uh, introduce the participants at this round table on uh, climate change, a challenge for the economic recovery. Valérie masson delmont is a share, uh, researcher at Paris Salquet, co-president of a group of experts with uh, the uh, GEC, with the uh, panel on climate change, the IPCC, and uh, they are addressing key issues uh, that face society currently. Then we have Michel Fredo. Who is uh, an advisor, a strategic advisor, and uh, works in uh, a consultancy? He has specialized in changes and uh, climate challenges around the world, and it's important for us in the course of our discussion to know that he advises any number of states when it comes to transformation. And uh, he's a partner of our network. Then we have uh, Jean-Pierre Rondou, a known uh, person who is in charge of SNCF uh, since uh, 2019. And of course, uh, that lies at the heart. Uh, the railroad lies at the heart of uh, changes. It's a virtuous mode of travel. And then we have friends uh, who will be attending from a distance this year. Of course, we're very fortunate, uh, some of us, to be here in person, and we also have other participants who will be talking from a distance. Maya Dina Bossetti, who is a researcher, and she specializes in matters pertaining to the energy transition. On the screen, I don't know. Well, we have Linda uh, Hassan Fratz. Raise your hand, please. Hello. And then Luca Cazzelli, who uh, uh, is from Greece. I know it's a bit uh, trickier when you're attending at a distance, but thank you very much for being with us this afternoon. I'll give the floor to Claire Vaison, who I haven't introduced from the Circle of Economists. She's uh, Director General and uh, she works at a very high level in the ministerial cabinet. I will uh, let uh, Claire introduce the overall framework for this round table. Thank you, Bruno. And good afternoon, everybody. It's a very topical issue, obviously. 49.6 degrees in the Canadian West this uh, week. I think we've all noted that fact. And there have been other spectacular uh, climate events over the past few years. Think of the fires in Sweden and many other such uh, events increasingly. And I hope in any event that we are all convinced of the fact that climate change is not a topic for future generations. It's uh, up to us to deal with climate change and to do so right now. So we will have an upper opportunity as we emerge from the COVID crisis to reorient investment and speed up ecological transition and the energy transition. First comment, there are huge needs for financing. The EU alone estimated a few months ago that the need for financing in the EU would be something like 400 billion euros over the next few years. 30% would be dedicated to changing the offering and uh, the remainder to changing uh, the demand. The energy transition means that we have to change the mode of consumption and production, and we need to change in particular in sectors like building and transport, and we'll talk about that a bit later on. Also, it's necessary 
to uh, have a greener energy mix, 400 billion euros a year. That's a huge sum of money. So we're going to need money from the state and also private investment. Second comment. It's more of a structural uh, issue than just a, a passing problem. We've talked about a recovery plan, but the econ world economies are recovering very quickly. So it's uh, less a question of macroeconomic readjustment to relaunch activity now than to reallocate investment over the long term to provide for this ecological transition. And then there's a third comment I would like to make. We're talking about uh, government investment and private investment and uh, large amounts of both. But even to reorient private investment, the role of the government is uh, paramount. We're talking about uh, state subsidies, uh, uh, tax breaks, uh, regulatory uh, provisions like the price of fuel now, and carbon pricing. Economists uh, don't understand why we talk about carbon pricing. I just want to say, however, that uh, the carbon price is giving rise to huge debates in Europe. And what is the relevant scope of this? This is very important, in particular in building and transport. I would like to say that whatever the uh, tool used, one should be aware of the fact that the ecological transition carries a cost. And this cost, in any event, has to be taken into account in order to uh, help households that uh, can't bear this additional cost. There will be regulatory tools that provide for greener consumption, for example, uh, changing your car, for example. You can do this on the strength of regulations or through the pricing of fuel, but you have to be careful because some people will lose out and they won't be able to bear the increases in, in costs and prices. We're just uh, recovering from a crisis. Some parts uh, of the population are very vulnerable, and I'm thinking in particular of young people who are trying to get jobs, and uh, often women as well, who've suffered from uh, the pandemic in particular. Last comment, because time is marching on. The role of the state, the government, uh, is of great importance, and there are many things that only governments can do. Here, I'm referring to incentives uh, to innovate and develop certain technologies to provide for an energy transition that won't take place uh, just thanks to mature technologies. New technologies will have to emerge. Of course, this is all difficult to achieve. It's extremely difficult for governments to decide which technologies uh, will actually make it, which uh, will help uh, to foster a good energy mix by 2050. And the answer to this question is that uh, decision makers will have to uh, have a diversified mix, a wide range of possibilities. And uh, too narrow choices shouldn't be made because in the long run, this will too heavily impact purchasing power and the competitiveness of the economy. In other words, when it comes to the energy transition, there will be a mix, no doubt, in the future, which is very broad. Also, you need to be able to store renewable energies, intermittent ones. We don't know how this will be done, and the technologies will no doubt evolve. In terms of uh, fuel cells, hydrogen, there will be other sources of uh, energy. I'll stop there. With us today, we have uh, representatives of academia, political life, and uh, the private sector. We have absolutely everyone we need to deal with this matter. Valérie Masson-Delmotte, let's take up Claire's first point when it comes to launching the discussion. Climate change uh, is for now. Luckily, you have contributed to converting many people who are skeptical about climate change. Climate change is something which is urgent right now, particularly considering the latest report of uh, the Council for the Climate. And uh, the situation is even more alarming than uh, the scenarios which had been sketched out. Things are moving faster than expected. 
Yes, uh, greenhouse gases are being spewed out in vast quantities. Before the pandemic, uh, we were at a given level, and this is increasing. The climate is reacting to these greenhouse gases going up into space. Energy is building up in the oceans. That's making certain changes irreversible. Likewise, we have the cryosphere, etc., which is heavily impacted. The climate changes around the Earth, and then that directly affects uh, certain parameters and characteristics around the world. Temperatures are increasing. There are more uh, frequent uh, cold spells, uh, extremely hot spells. It changes the water cycle. One of the hot points is the Mediterranean when it comes to climate change. A certain number of events are directly linked to global warming. The increase uh, of the severity of drought, uh, torrential rain, uh, that also occurs in other parts of the world. Uh, the atmosphere is hotter, there is more uh, water vapor, and also there are more uh, forest fires. That's directly linked to global warming. The pandemic is a temporary thing. During the lockdowns, there was an economic slowdown. There was a drop in the emission of greenhouse gases by about 6%. The effects were even seen in terms of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. But uh, things are going back up. Greenhouse gases dropped a little bit, but levels in the atmosphere continue to increase. So what will be essential? is uh, the relaunching of economic activity and employment. That will uh, condition lasting effects. Now, if we choose to provide support with energy uh, intensive industries, they may continue to emit a lot of greenhouse gases, and these emissions will continue to increase over the years to come, leading to even greater warming. However, if the relaunch plan uh, fosters structural change, and this affects all the low-carbon sectors, then on the contrary, we can meet our, the challenge. Now, if uh, greenhouse gas uh, emission targets are achieved throughout the world, if uh, levels remain stable by 2030, that won't necessarily stabilize the climate, but we have to lower, in fact, the emission of greenhouse gases. It's what will condition the uh, increase in temperature around the world is uh, CO2 emissions. We need to achieve uh, zero net carbon emissions. There are other human factors, greenhouse gases, for example, and particle pollution. All that has to be uh, lowered. So we have to act when it comes to energy, fossil energy intensive industries. That is what will condition the development of the climate. Now, when it comes to the Council for the Climate, the recovery plan in several European countries is, uh, well, in, in France and in many European countries like Germany, Spain, the UK, their plan is exemplary. But uh, we amount to perhaps uh, uh, only 17%. There is an unfavorable factor which will lead to sustained uh, use of fossil fuels, and that is equivalent to the same amount uh, which will be scaled back thanks to other means. I'd like to specify that if we don't take more stringent action, then uh, greenhouse gas emissions will lead to a warming of about 2 degrees by 2050 and 3 degrees by 2100. That's uh, what has been forecast. And there's a last point I'd like to mention, which has been broached in the last uh, Council for the Climate report. We need to adapt. When it comes to the climate, we can act on the causes of global warming, and also we can act when it comes to the consequences. Climate change has an impact on vulnerability, exposure, and there are answers to be found in this uh, area. We have to adapt uh, to uh, the new circumstances. We have to prepare for a, a climate which will be warmer over several decades, and the level of the sea will probably increase to rise, uh, continue to rise. And this is uh, a movement which spans centuries. So I think when it comes to uh, public strategy, this has to be taken into account. We also have to reinforce the resilience of our society and infrastructures. And we really have to undertake all these changes. It's a question of uh, safety and security, in fact. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, now, I think uh, we'll go on to Michel Fredo. What can states and companies do?
in the view of the circle of the economists. And how much will this cost? Who's going to pay? These are matters when you work down from the macroeconomic level, you have to uh, turn to the various players in the field and see what the costs and impacts will be. In terms uh, of the most dramatic scenario just described, perhaps uh, we can mention a few more positive aspects which uh, give rise to some hope. As you know, COP26 in Glasgow will take place in November. It's a very important COP because it follows on the Paris uh, COP six years ago, where in fact all states uh, committed a pledge to develop a plan of action to uh, check global warming. And if you look at all the commitments and pledges, we'll end up with uh, uh, three degrees more than just uh, as opposed to two or 2.5. And it's up to COP, and the negotiations are underway to ensure that all the states uh, comply with what was said in uh, Paris, uh, the goal being uh, uh, 1.5 degrees. Now, what about countries' pledges? There are true policies that have been introduced. It's not just a question of scaling back emissions. It's necessary, in addition, to have a carbon tax. Uh, there has to be a proper plan to phase out coal. And there are any number of uh, examples. Greece is quite a good uh, student and ha has a very clear-cut plan when it comes to decommissioning coal-driven power plants. And deforestation is an area where one must act. Transparency is required. And everything you said as well in terms of innovation. And things work sector by sector. You need to have policies which will make it possible to ensure that the goals can truly uh, be met. So this COP is extremely important. Also, you have the Western countries and the emerging countries which can cooperate. And there's a fund worth about 100 billion a year which is supposed to be set up. And there are any number of sources of support. So this forthcoming COP is very important. And thanks to COP, there is a momentum which will develop. And vis-a-vis -vis companies and financial institutes, uh, this appears quite reassuring. The climate is a whole system. A given company, a given player can do things and must do things, but that's not sufficient. It's the entire system that has to be changed. It's supply and demand. Uh, supply is the whole chain of value of demand. You need policy, standards, regulation. And we consumers also are part of the chain. We have to change our behavior, otherwise nothing's going to happen. So it's the entire system that has to evolve. Having said this, if you look at the various components in the system, there I have some good news to share with you. At country level, uh, as we saw a few weeks ago, and in the US, at least they've returned to the Paris Agreement, which is fabulous. China has announced uh, uh, net zero as a pledge, even if it's by 2060, it's a good starting point because there was nothing in the past a few years ago. When Jean does something, then usually uh, Japan and South Korea follow. So any number of countries are becoming more engaged, and that uh, is a very positive uh, source of change when it comes to companies. COP has strategic uh, partners. Uh, we have both COP uh, and also private companies, non-state entities which want to, to take up the challenge. And they are announcing the risk zero. They want to engage in the largest possible number of players to pledge zero emissions uh, in all sectors around the world. The number of companies becoming mobilized uh, who are joining this movement is increasing. The idea is zero by 2050 to make that pledge and to also pledge to attain targets. We have targets for the next 10 or 15 years. And there, uh, twice as many companies are becoming involved, which is fantastic. Now, on the investor side, because you need to put up a lot of financing, figures were given for Europe. 
$150,000 billion up until 2050 will be required. That's a huge amount of money uh, per year that will have to be financed to bring about a transition in the electricity and energy systems and to make all this transition possible. So states will have to contribute, but also financiers and investors and, and private entities will have to put up money. There's a banking association called GFNZ, where it's the banks which have met together. There are 45 banks which have, uh, uh, are going to put up uh, $45 trillion, and they'll help to finance their customers uh, in terms of uh, measures to bring about this transition. So there are lots of very interesting initiatives been taking. When you add all this up and you say, will we manage to uh, reduce emissions by 45%, that's a, a real question. But there is hope out there. Our conviction, our deep-seated belief is that given the changes taking place in the system and in companies, this is a huge, a, a, a comprehensive change that we have to bring about. We have to deal with the risks as well. There are all sorts of risks for companies today, risks for their business model, which may not be a consistent uh, with what the company will need by 2030, but there are also fantastic opportunities to grasp. So that is the other side of the message I want to convey. The momentum is there, and com it's in the interests of companies to participate. It's in their interests because their business model in the future will be different from that of today. So we can uh, wait for policies or standards to be there, but uh, the faster the private sector becomes involved, the better we'll manage the goals. I'll stop there and give the floor to our next speaker. Thank you very much, uh, Michel Fredo. I think I will now give the floor to Luca Katzeli. I hope she can see me. She works for the National Bank of Greece. Our participant, uh, our speaker, was saying that Greece uh, was a, a star pupil. I'm not sure if we are star pupil, but uh, uh, let me kind of highlight the, what I consider major challenges so that we can move from pledges and intentions to actually policy shifts. Uh, allow me to raise a few points. First of all, that we need to prevent this, the exacerbation of the crisis, to mitigate its effects, and to ensure that there is a fair burden sharing so that we can actually shift from intentions and pledges to actually policy results. Now, what are the challenges? I would highlight three challenges. The first one, that the responses need to be global, because the climate change crisis is a global crisis. But we have no governance, a global governance system. So we have to rely on agreements or intergovernmental agreements, which are lengthy, usually ineffective, and end up producing policies that are non-binding and reflect a lowest common denominator. The second challenge is a different one, which has already been raised. Namely, that you have powerful multinationals, which are important stakeholders. However, these multinationals, these players, do not sit around the negotiating table in the context of the Bretton Woods institutions, which are all intergovernmental in character. And the third challenge is that national governments have lost over time their capacity and the degrees of freedom and negotiating power vis-a-vis -vis the major actors and the major private sector participants. So they have lost a uh, kind of um, free degrees of freedom in regulating markets to prevent and manage the crisis more effectively, even though they bear the fiscal and financial costs to prevent or redress damages and compensate those affected. So if we consider these challenges, uh, what citizens do is usually, I'm afraid, they have lost a lot of trust in the capacity of governments to protect their interests and promote prevention, mitigation, and fair burden sharing. Now, if we could take into account these three challenges, then they highlight what I would call a major agency failure in addressing the climate crisis and facilitate what has come to be known as a just transition. What is a just transition? Uh, it has been defined by the European Trade Union Confederation as a long-term plan to achieve ambitious climate action 
in a way that benefits the whole of society and does not simply pile the costs on the least privileged. It has to do with fair burden sharing as we address the environmental challenges. Now, in the absence of a global governance system and, and the, in the absence of powerful national governments, uh, I want to stress that, in my view, it's only Europe that can deliver these public or collective goods that can ensure our collective sustainable well-being. And it's a huge responsibility for Europe and the Commission and for all member states to actually address this huge responsibility. This an economically prosperous union of more than 500 million people has the bargaining power to do the prevention, to do the mitigation, to do the fair burden sharing. No single government or member state can mitigate by itself environmental hazards caused by climatic change. Now, if Europe is, needs to do this and pick up the, the burden, then we need to, for it to be able to do it, it needs to, we need to convince everyone that Europe can be inclusive, just and democratic so that policies can ensure decent livelihoods for all. Now, in that light, and given this challenge, uh, a few years ago, in 2018, an independent commission on sustainable equality was convened. It was sponsored by the parliamentary group of the Progressive Alliance of Socialists and Democrats in the European Parliament. I had the honor to co-chair that commission together with uh, the ex-prime minister of Denmark, Paul Rasmussen. And we issued in November 2018 uh, what was considered an influential report entitled Well-Being for Everyone in a Sustainable Europe that made a series of policy recommendations to facilitate socio-ecological progress and more importantly to enable change because I think this is the major challenge. Can we enable change? Now, uh, let me very briefly summarize the th three main points. First, that in light of the commitments undertaken at the UN in 2015 by all EU member states to implement the SDGs by 2030, the report calls for the implementation of a sustainable policy agenda that is embedded, and that's what I want to stress, in an alternative vision of progress. An alternative vision of progress which promotes well-being as opposed to growth. Policy making for well-being, the so-called Agenda 2030, considers people as actors and beneficiaries of transformations in production and consumption patterns, as opposed to victims or passive targets of such transformations. Instead of adopting an exclusive focus on economic and investment considerations, it integrates the three dimensions of change, namely economic, social, and environmental dimensions, into all sectoral policies and governance processes. Thus, it addresses energy poverty to guarantee basic living standards and or gives priority to skill formation, redeployment, labor reallocation policies, etc., to mitigate inequalities. It introduces compensatory schemes or financial instruments to ease the transition in carbon dependent regions and supports communities impacted by the transformation. It empowers people on the technological options offered and governments to address market failures. Now, that sounds all good, but can we do it? Well, I think the most important recommendation of the report is how to proceed, how to enable change, and how to enable implementation. And what we call for is a revamped governance model for policy, for public policy in Europe. It recommends, in other words, the introduction of what we call a sustainable development pact, pact to replace the Stability and Growth Pact, which is the existing one, in the context of the existing multi-annual European semester. The European semester, which is the annual uh, policy monitoring and evaluation process in Europe, is uh, replaced by the uh, what is called the European Sustainable Semester. And uh, in that framework, the Sustainable Development Pact comes to replace the growth and stability pact. Now, what does this mean in practice? It means that the present stability and growth pact, which is based on the Maastricht criteria, 
and uses only a few economic indicators to monitor and guide national policies of member states, namely it uses growth, a public deficit, and debt to GDP criteria, should be replaced by this European Sustainable Pact, which uses appropriate economic, social, and environmental indicators to monitor and guide EU policy making across member states. Sound fiscal policy is thus put on an equal footing with sustainable development policies and social and environmental progress. Uh, Let me conclude by saying so, that if so, we want policies for mitigating the climate crisis to succeed and to be implemented, we need to change the rules of the game for policy making in Europe. Thank you. It is the only thank way you, uh, to implement the SDGs. So, sorry to which all member states have adhered to, to address the environmental crisis, Thank to you. mitigate so the rising sorry. inequalities and social tensions, and to enhance transparency, democratic accountability, and trust in European institutions. So there has been a lot of work done by both by the Independent Commission, so and you, I'm happy Ms. to say that about Katzeli. 60 of the 100 recommendations that that Independent Commission has sorry. proposed are already have been taken up uh, by the Commission, by European Parliament, and uh, we are monitoring progress closely and we are about to issue the second report of the Commission on, uh, entitled The Great Shift on actually following up these proposals and see how we can <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Ms. Castelli. Um, I turn to Jean-Pierre Farandou. We go to Jean-Pierre Farandou and trains, uh, which is a virtuous mode of transport, but the CNCF uh, has also had to transform its model. What was your uh, secret recipe, even if, uh, I mean, you've been there for two years now? Well, uh, what strikes me here in this affair is that you have to go very quickly. You know, the, I often think, in fact, of what President Chirac said, that the house is burning and we're looking elsewhere. So we've got to stop looking elsewhere. We've got to look at the house, we've got to act. It's, you know, we've already looked, now we need to act. And when I hear what you say, we really need to act. Uh, I'm not sure that this emergency situation is really shared today, as the observation is shared, most certainly, but the emergency uh, you know, the urgent, the requirement for an urgent action is not shared. And the consequences of the action, that's the same thing. And transport, well, one is, is one of the first uh, sectors where there are uh, CO2 emissions. And so we have to do something about that. Now, rail, when rail became electric and carbon free, uh, no longer used coal, uh, we, we were lucky. But, uh, you know, then we have nuclear power in France as well. So it's carbon free is the rail transport. Just give you some figures. So a trip by high speed train between Paris and Aix-Provence, it's 50 times less than the same trip by car. So the ratios are considerable and 80 times less than if you're going to Marignan. So the differences are considerable. The carbon footprint of a trip on the train has nothing uh, is nothing like uh, traveling by car. So we have to really focus on this uh, modal uh, transport form. Now I have a, a, a view of this because lots of actions have been implemented already. We're, we're in the middle of the action and uh, we've got uh, objectives, we've got indicators and all of that and we need a vision and the SNCF vision uh, is uh, quite audacious. It's times two. That's what our vision is. The ambition that I give to the SNCF uh, is to transport twice as many people in 10 years' time and twice as many goods in 10 years' time. And this is a considerable challenge. And once we've said this, we've got to do it. You know, it's all very well saying it, but what about doing it? The company has things to do in terms of services, accessibility, affordability, uh, innovation as well, of course. Uh, the company has to lead in terms of services so that people want to use rail services more, uh, you know. And states have to play a role as well. 
when you're in a sector like mobility, states have a role to play. Otherwise, we won't be able to achieve object objectives. We can only correct the impacts of human activity by acting on uh, infrastructures, by removing carbon emissions in the rail field. This is what we're doing, and it has to be done. So we're lucky. Uh, so we're but we need to move on to action. There's going to be a bit of a difference between what's uh, being said and what's uh, being done. So I think there's a sincere determination at European level to finance uh, programs and to change uh, the way people uh, use transport modes. I will look carefully at the uh, different candidates' programs when it comes to elections, whether they're focusing on transport or not. It's something that I look at very specifically. I look at the transport question and rail transport in particular because we have to invest in the rail system in France if we want to reach our objectives. I think that rail transport is one of the solutions, but we need investments. We need to change the rules of the game in terms of the SNCF. It's very clear. We want to include in the European carbon system mobility, generally speaking. We've got agreements uh, in this sense. We've got agreements, but uh, French governors they're hesitant you know, because of the yellow vest uh, movement. Things are very complicated. We could have done things, the state could have done things, but the reaction of some citizens uh, is still very present in people's minds. So we've got to try and reconcile strong public policies based on tax with acceptability of the population. So if we don't do this, we'll have more hesitation or we'll have very hostile reactions that will undermine uh, the decisions taken. Second point that is important, and I'd like to fuel and uh, come back to what you said. I don't know whether it was, you did this. We are an eco-industrial company. Of course, there's the uh, switch from a modal point of view. But what about the industrial challenges? Are? Well, we don't uh, want, we want to focus on CO2 emissions. 20% of our traffic is based on diesel engines. We're not going to electrify lines. It wouldn't be logic. And it ha an investment has to be relevant. We've got to work on motorization in the short term, hybrid motors, battery uh, engines. I really believe very much in hydrogen. Uh, you've said this. It's one of uh, these solutions. We're going to be working on biofuels, etc. But hydrogen can be one main solution to the question of how do we uh, stop using diesel engines. We need to produce energy. We did this in the 80s, in fact. Remember the hydro power dams in the Pyrenees? They belonged to the SNCF, but we've sold them now. Perhaps it was in your uh, neck of the woods, uh, madam. We know where they are. They're somewhere. They're not closed. Uh, that's one thing. But I think that the SNCF has, you know, different industrial areas uh, that can be fitted with solar panels. I hope that we have a very proactive policy implemented. It, we're beginning to talk about industrial partnerships with EDF, with Total. We're looking at this, uh, and the scale is big. We have to be audacious. The, the solutions have to be big. You can have a, a series of small solutions, but when you're a big company like the SNCF, you need to be audacious and you need to think big. So these are the main uh, directions that I, I will be taking the SNCF in. So there's a lot of strong motivation inside. We're talking about subjects that interest the public, uh, especially the young generation. So we're going to be attracting a lot of young people because it gives a sense to what everything and to what people are doing. So I agree with what you said earlier. Thank you. So mobility on one side, protection of the planet on the other. Thank you, Jean-Pierre uh, Fredo. So from train to mo so to motor cars. Now let's move on to Linda Hasenfrat from the Linamar Corporation. Hello, can you hear us, Linda? What is your point of view? What is your point of view about all of this? Thanks so much. It's a real pleasure for me to join you this afternoon uh, for the panel. Uh, just a, a bit of context about uh, who Linamar is. We're a diversified advanced manufacturing company. We're global. Uh, in footprint, we have about 25,000 employees in 61 plants around the world. We are 70% in auto parts, an industry, of course, that is in enormous change and opportunity today, specifically driving from climate change. Uh, about 30% of our business 
uh, is in industrial businesses such as access equipment that we manufacture under the brand name Skyjack and harvesting equipment uh, which we manufacture under the brand name Macdon. And of course those industries and agriculture in specific uh, is also a huge area of opportunity when it comes to uh, climate change and the technology evolution uh, that needs to happen. And, uh, you know, I, I was really interested in joining in this panel because the title of the panel, panel sort of implies that climate change is a challenge to the economy and to industry. But actually, I believe the opposite. I think it's our biggest opportunity for sustained and significant growth uh, in the future. In fact, Climate change is the underpinning strategy in terms of product development, in terms of process development, and how we're running our facilities and how we're changing uh, to do that in each of our businesses. I mean, obviously, in the mobility business, the priority is all about electrification and emission reduction, lighter, quieter. Uh, you know, that it, it drives um, the environmental footprint, obviously, but, but also the efficiency of the operation of those vehicles. Uh, in our access uh, uh, business, Skyjack, we're also focused on electrification and finding ways uh, to reduce the power consumption uh, of our products. It's also about digitization and telematics to more efficiently manage our fleets or our customers to manage their fleets. Uh, and at MacDon, in our harvesting business, it's all about precision agriculture, right? Using what you need where you need it instead of this sort of broad-based approach that has been used historically and that dramatically improves the environmental footprint and at the same time helps to optimize harvest and drive better efficiency and then of course within our facilities there's a uh, huge change happening as well to reduce our carbon footprint and drive better operational efficiency and access uh, to data which by the way is also financially beneficial right like if we can reduce our energy usage, if we can reduce our water usage, we are making an, an improvement environmentally. We're also making an improvement in terms of the cost of how we're, we're running our facilities. So you know, we track these metrics uh, consistently, energy consumption uh, per dollar of sales. So you know may, that's consistently trending down. Uh, similarly, water consumption per dollar of sales. I mean, these are metrics that we want to see improving um, year over year. So uh, just a, a few thoughts on uh, how we develop the right solutions. I mean, everybody's talked about the, the imperative, and I couldn't agree more that we must act today uh, in order to, to meet the goals that we've set uh, for the future. This isn't something that we can, can wait on. But I think we need to be careful about our approach. I think we need to be very focused on end-to-end -end sort of fact-based solutions, not little slices of a product cycle, so having a more holistic um, approach. Uh, the mobility area is a great example of that. There's a huge transi transition, obviously, happening towards battery electric vehicles, which is a great thing, you know, to move, uh, move in that direction. The problem is, until we get an energy infrastructure that is clean, we're not making as big of an impact as we'd like to make, right, in terms of the overall emissions. If we take the emissions away from the pit tailpipe, but it's now uh, at the uh, energy production facility driving off of carbon-based uh, energy production, then we haven't made the difference that we're looking to make. So we need to do both hand in hand. We absolutely need to change to the battery electric vehicles, but we also need to change the energy uh, infrastructure uh, ultimately, in my opinion, we need to move towards uh, hydro a hydrogen-based future when it comes to mobility for basically that very reason, that it, it does have an end-to-end -end green solution where you can, you can have um, hydrogen that is uh, made from water uh, using uh, renewable energy, right? So in a way, you're, you're kind of storing renewable energy in hydrogen temporarily because when you run it through the fuel cell, it turns back into water afterwards. And you know, there's lots of other examples out there on the agricultural side, you know, pipelines here in North America, there's big pushback against uh, pipelines, but, you know, until we're off of uh, oil and gas, then they are a safer and less energy consumption, con consuming way to transport uh, energy than a uh, rail or truck. So the second thing I think is important is that we need to realize that many of these strategies will be quite long-term in terms of how they play out. So, 
again, why we need to start uh, today. Change takes time to happen from a technology perspective and from an investment perspective, as some of, uh, so, of the others have talked about. There's an enormous amount of investment to be made. Look at the transition to an electri electrified okay. future in mobility as a great example. Today, about 5% of the world's 84 million vehicles that are being produced every year are battery electric. S so to transition sorry. to the 95% you know, that aren't electric today requires enormous investment uh, and it requires uh, an enormous time. It also requires the consumer to get on board and the price to be uh, on board as well. So. Uh, we need to understand that it's long term and, uh, okay, and so also, uh, sorry. again, I'm sorry, the, uh, can I stop you there? Okay, thank you. Yes. Um, Madame uh, Bossetti, Valentina Bossetti. Mrs. B Valentina Bossetti, hello. We are going to move on to another speaker now. Thank you very much. Linda. I'm going to turn to Valentina now to finalize this diagnosis that has been carried out because you're, a, you're specialized in the notions of energy transition and you can give us a diagnosis of, of, of the costs that that represents perhaps. Um, so you have the floor. Um, yeah. We could not hear each other so I'm talking without knowing what uh, has been said before. And also that I, uh, I am happy that you want women in the panel, but then you have to introduce women as uh, completely as you do with men in general. I think that's a, that's, that's a, good, a good way of dealing with the presence of people in panels in general. So I'll, uh, given that I don't know what others said, because uh, for us it was impossible to hear each other, uh, I would just um, talk about three points. Uh, the first is that if we're serious about the, the the carbonization transition, then the first move to undertake is that of eliminating subsidies to fossil fuels, which are still uh, very present and alive uh, in Europe. Um, we work with model runs within the IPCC and other analyses, and it emerges clearly that investments, uh, if we are serious about the carbonization, that's point number two, investments in uh, uh, coal uh, should be basically eliminated nearly immediately, and uh, investment in gas and oil should strongly be reduced. And it's also, you know, I guess a good, uh, you know, uh, a good uh, threshold to keep in mind when evaluating the recovery plans of countries. Um, the investment in non-fossil technologies should ramp up to the 50% that it is today of total investment in the energy system to roughly 80% of which a good part, as you might imagine, would go to solar and wind, but then a large part of investment should also go to the grid and general to infrastructure that uh, and storage that help stabilize and um, uh, the intermittencies that is introduced by the presence of renewables. Uh, we all want uh, green power, but we also want to have uh, reliable power because that's very important for economic development. Um, with that, uh, I think uh, I mean, these are the key points uh, to keep in mind when thinking about uh, the transition. A third point concerns more the farther part uh, of uh, this first part of the century. So towards 2050, 2060, we will start to reach uh, uh, net zero emissions, uh, both e either of CO2 emissions or greenhouse gases emissions. What that means when you hear net, net zero, that doesn't mean that all emissions are going to zero. It means that some sectors that are harder to decarbonize will still emit. Think, for example, some industrial sectors um, for which is very hard to think in the, at this very moment uh, uh, a carbon-free solution or think about aviation. And the other sectors will then have to compensate. If we want net emissions to zero, it means that some sectors will have to produce negative emissions. What that means is that uh, CO2 is taken outside the atmosphere and stored where? Either in biomass, 
but then if it's storing biomass, it has to stay there or in the soils or underground. So there's various technologies, some of which can also produce electricity while at the same time uh, taking away CO2 from the atmosphere. I think these are the key uh, main points. There was a report that just came out in France. Um, this is the Tyrol Blanchard report. It has an important chapter on climate change. I think uh, there are a lot of, I mean, these three, three key points that I just made are there and other many interesting points. So I think it should be worth mentioning in this context, uh, this very important French report on climate change. Thank you so much. Thank you, Valentina. It's difficult to hear alarming things. Uh, Michel Frido, your message is more positive. You know, the recovery plan, the need to adapt. Well, given everything that's been said, it's a risk for companies, but it's also an opportunity to create tomorrow's business and, and to build a competitive edge. We're convinced that uh, you know the, the faster we do something, the better we will be. So even if it involves costs developing these solutions, at least we'll be able to control them better. Then there's the whole series of other components that will be added. We've got to remove the carbon from our operations, but we've also got to build the business of tomorrow. This requires a lot of innovation. And here again, companies will have to think about how they're going to change their business models. We can see that it's all about working on ecosystems. You know, each uh, company can only uh, do it at its own scale. You know, we, we can't uh, do it alone, however. We've got to have the right partnerships, and there aren't that many. But, the, you know, as I said, uh, the faster we get on with it, the better we will feel. So uh, there are many investors who are joining the battle. If we can have access to financing, of course, we have to have the right projects. And the last point is talent. Uh, it's going to be a war out there because all of that requires new skills and we don't have them. Well, we've got some of them, so these skills will have to be developed. These are important facts. So it's true for companies, but it's also true at national level. In France, we're lucky to have a highly favorable context when it comes to climate and the environment. Even if you know we've got progress to, that we have to be made, but when we compare what we do to China and South Africa, and we've got champion companies. So how do we keep that competitive edge in France so that in 2013, we're still champions? That's an, something else. You know, France has everything to be able to do that. Michel, perhaps uh, a word to, to conclude. Uh, Valérie? So we're talking about a context uh, like a pandemic. The point that we didn't bring up was how public policies that are ambitious in terms of climate, how that are virtuous in terms of health, so the decarbonation of industry and transport, this is what's going to allow us to improve the quality of air very clearly. And this is a major point when it comes to public health, especially in emerging countries. The second point concerns active mobility. We've got children who've lost in terms of physical capacity, and this is very worrying across the world. Their feet, you know, walking, cycling, the infrastructures for these activities. There are solutions that allow us to combine different forms of mobility, to trains in, uh, in stations. And the last part, to uh, have healthier food so that we can live longer and in good health. This food um, has a, a smaller impact on the climate. This means that we need to come out of our silos. We need to have public policies that maximize benefits. Thank you, uh, Valérie masson denmont We're going to have to conclude now. Perhaps, Claire, you would like to conclude, give a few final words. Thank you, Bruno. So just a word to say that um, now we've really got a consensus about the need to add to the fact that it is urgent, and that's the first piece of good news. There's this need to, to act, therefore we have a consensus about that, and we've got a consensus about the way we can do this. Everybody around the table talked about the need to change the production means that we have, to change uh, consumption habits. Once we've said all of this, of course, uh, then there are sector-based realities that vary, and there are question, quest, there's the question of acceptability. Um, this kind of um, came out 
between the lines in the panel discussion. It's something that must not be underestimated. We need to have the right kind of transition, a fair transition that involves everybody. Social acceptability is also about quite simply uh, thinking differently about how we produce. And when we see the debate that we have in France about the question of you know where wind turbines are set up and the difficulty um, we have putting uh, wind turbines offshore, now that we have got a consensus in terms of how urgent it is to act, now um, we people know that it's urgent to act. So I think that this uh, panel discussion is, is, is just a small pebble on the path uh, towards uh, something more successful and hopefully other debates will contribute to this. Thank you.